and welcome to the Many Hats podcast, where we explore the fascinating journeys of entrepreneurs and leaders who have donned multiple hats in their respective fields. Join your host, Stuart Forsyth, along with special guests as they delve into the stories and insights of individuals who possess a unique blend of talents and expertise, making them true multidisciplinarians. Now, let's dive into today's episode. So welcome back to my podcast, the Many Hats Podcast. My name is Stuart Forsyth. Um, today, I'm really excited to be welcoming Del Cotton. Del, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Stuart. How are you? I'm great, thanks. And I'm I'm really chuffed that you've agreed to come down. Um, we've just had a bit of a conversation mm. spanning about half an hour. And we've, we've kind of talked about most of it. We're hopefully going to talk about this podcast. I'll just get my podcast. coat and go now. Aye, <laughs> but I'm keen for folk who listen to, uh, to, to hear this as well. Del, you run a a company called hireaband.co.uk. Mm -hmm. Is that what you call it, hireaband.co.uk, or would you call it hireaband? We call it hireaband now. Yeah. Um, at the start, we we were probably one of the first companies to have a proper website in, yeah. in that field, so we used the .co.uk thing there. Um, but you can find us on .com or, or .co right. or whatever, but .co.uk. So, so I, I, I refer to hireaband as hireaband. Do you? Aye. So, interestingly, so I kind of stole that idea for you. You did? <laughs> When I started Limelight... Invoices in the post. <laughs> we'll give you a commission for it. When I started Limelight, um, I thought there must be a ton of Limelights about. But as I started referring it to limelightmedia.co.uk, mm -hmm. all of a sudden people just knew my Aye. website yeah, and good. were able to come along. So good. it was a wee market employee that I, that I stole. Aye, it works well. Um, the hire a band thing kind of tells you what we do. Um, and no doubt we'll talk about that. But the back then when we, when we got the domain, mm -hmm. which was in 1999... Um, the, the 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 done thing then was to kind of have what you do in the name. Now that's that changed quite quickly after that, and it became a bad thing if you were called I don't know um, carsforhire dot right. com. That would Google didn't like that. You, all we do is please the Google gods. Right. Um, <laughs> but at the time, um, getting a domain like that was was a, a real find. It was a real godsend. You told me years ago. Um, and we'll get into the context of how we had this conversation, but you told me you picked up that domain name for £9.99. £9.99. Pounds, £9 pence. <laughs> that was in 1999 when £9 was £9. Aye. But uh, I, I had the idea in the middle of the night, and I was convinced that when I came downstairs on my four-gig computer, which was state-of-the-art at the time, <laughs> uh, I was convinced that that name would, would be unavailable, and it was available as, right. as one word, you know. Um, and then a few... Not that long later, one of, in fact, my first member of staff found that .com was available as well, right. so we, we bought that too, and right. I think that was maybe a 15 quid or something then. Um, so we've been paying for, for our domains and every derivative or derivation of hire a band ever yeah. since, because you have to protect your brand. Of course you do. But yeah, I don't think it would be as cheap now to get a, to oh, get a name I, like I would imagine upwards of... Five grand. Aye, God knows if you were starting um, yeah. to have a to get a really good. Well, they're, they're used up, aren't they? I mean, that's that's the issue. Yep. But you have to have something that's memorable. Um, interestingly, when you ask for a, not so much now, but previously when you had a, a computer, uh, saying your company name, you get like if you were asking a sat nav to take you to the hire a band office, it would call it Harry a band or. That's right. That kind of thing. And also, when you're speaking to people on the phone and they ask you what, what, which company you're from, and you say hire a band, hire a van, no, hire a band. Hire a band. So it does have, it's not perfect, yep. but uh, it certainly tells you what we do. And it also helps massively if you're searching, using that phrase that for a search, if you're looking for hire a band. Yep. There's an obvious place, and it's so easy for us to, to, to come first for that. Yep. So, aye, it's a cracking domain. And, and I it, love the concept of hire a band. Um, Tell me how it came about. Where did the idea come from? And, you know, I mean, it was 25 years ago now. Aye, right? in 1999, we started the business. And, you know, we're, we're entertainment agents. It's as simple as that. And that's a that's um, a, a, a kind of business, a business model that's been around since entertainment started. There's always been the, the middleman, the, the, the go-to guy or go-to girl that uh, arranges the entertainer for the, the client. At that time, in 1999, I was still in the middle of my, my gigging career as a, as a, a wedding musician. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have been in my early 30s then at that point. I'd been gigging for 10 years, mm -hmm. maybe longer. I've been, I'm 58 now, so I've been in this industry for 40 years, one way or another. Wow. But gigging properly in my early 20s, um, we started off, or I started off, I joined a band, got a few bands, and 
some of those bands are still around. Is that right? Uh, there's a band called we. I was we. Our first band was called Original Sin. Uh, we were a kind of cheap in excess rip off. We weren't a tribute band, we just used that whole idea. And I was a big Michael Hutchins fan, mm -hmm. fan at the time. So we did rock covers, um, all covers. We've never done any original music because none of us were any good at writing original music. Or the Beatles had beaten us to it. <laughs> so we had original sin, did rock covers, played bars. They fight our way out of quite a few of those bars all over Ayrshire. And then we went down to a three-piece because Midi Files came along. That's how old I am. Right. And when Midi Files came along, you suddenly... Um, you were seeing bands making more money than we were. We were lucky. We were getting paid in, in um, Newcastle Brown Ale sometimes and uh, sandwiches and stuff. I mean, we didn't make it hardly a penny. Totally. But we loved it. It was great fun. Uh, but anyway, Avarice started to raise its ugly head and we realised that we could actually make a bit of money. Uh, excuse me. Then Midi Files came along. We could, we could work without a drummer, which was a terribly bad thing to do. Um, For those that don't know what Midi File is... <laughs> it's a little computer floppy disk... In a, in a hard plastic case, one song at a time. Yep. You put it into a, a MIDI file player and it had dreadful keyboard versions of the instruments you Back were missing. Yeah. You could always tell a MIDI file because it started... T -t 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 oh, of course. And then the song would start. <laughs> and if you were lucky, we all started at the same time. <laughs> so we went, we, the band became Atlanta. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we did, because we were less threatening and more able to do pop songs, we, we started to do weddings. The wedding market at that time was um, it was relatively untapped. Right. It was very uncool to play at weddings. Right. Bands back then in the 90s were still trying to get signed or play their own music and stuff like that. So to tell people you were in a wedding man was a bit of a beamer. Um, but it paid good money. Um, not, not the way it pays now. Um, and I think higher a band were, were actually responsible um, for increasing salaries that bands get yeah. uh, for playing at weddings but when you start we started doing weddings as a three piece band using media files then it, it just came from there mm -hmm. um, later on I was offered a job in a show in Glasgow <coughs> um, in, a, in a venue in Oswald Street called Ivory Blacks so that meant I had to leave the band because every Saturday night was you were involved in a show mm -hmm. so I left the band to do that and um, that lasted for a well over a year and it was great fun absolutely brilliant played with a live band um, a chap called Alan McPike was our MD mm -hmm. John Comiskey was on drums and the fantastic but uh, sadly departed Pat Stewart was uh, one of the singers George Cormack was one of the singers as well on that show and we played then uh, we did a, a rocking through the decades thing I, won't, I know I'm going off piece a wee bit here <laughs> it's all right. but it was great fun uh, and that show lasted until I think Ivory's was changing hands something like that or maybe it was just me <laughs> <laughs> But eventually we realised, okay, that show's coming to an end and um, I had to find a new gig. Mm -hmm. But then um, many discs had come along mm -hmm. and the tracks, the backing tracks had got a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I formed a wee, a, a really a solo act and I did weddings with a, a, a good friend of mine, a guy called Jim Mills, who came and did the, the audio, the sound for me. And we it was assumed we were a duo and we right. never disabused people. <laughs> So it was me out singing um, with our backing tracks and our, I'm a really bad guitar player, still am. Um, but we picked the right songs, didn't do anything with big guitar solos in it or anything like that, did a lot of Motown. We got some pub gigs. The pub gigs led to, in fact, I remember there's a place in here <clears throat> called Burrowfields, it was a Wednesday night gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got 70 quid for doing it. And that was great money. Thank you, know. I'm sure. <coughs> a great guy called Grant Steele that, that, um, that offered us that gig. And uh, we got 70 quid for two one-hour spots on a Wednesday regularly. And you knew you'd made it in Burrowfields because you'd your name up in different coloured chalk outside <laughs> the, the board. And I remember um, some wag one night had defaced our sign, so it said Del Cotton, and they had uh, defaced it, changed the, the chalk to Def Rotten. And I thought, oh, aye. I get it. <laughs> right, okay. Cut me and I bleed. <laughs> uh, so you get stuff like that. But anyway, that led to more and more weddings. And eventually you realise that um, <clears throat> there was a good living to be made doing weddings. We were in good money. Um, there was far fewer people to pay. And um, we got very popular very, very quickly mm -hmm. because we were still affordable. Um, we were compact. We could fit into small spaces. We were playing bang up to date tunes because when you're using backing tracks, you've no, you no band to rehearse. It's mm -hmm. a disgrace, but it's true. <laughs> it's glorified karaoke. Um, but the... 
the, 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 we were very good at giving the clients what they wanted. Mm-hmm. We played the right tunes. We were a good price. We were easy to set up, easy to strip down. And everything, if you asked me a question, the answer was yes. Mm-hmm. Can you do this? Yes. Can you go here? Yes. Can you play this long? Yes. So we just got more and more popular. And then eventually the diary filled up. Now, when that got to that stage, um, the, it's a rare thing as a working musician to be able to p- predict your income for the next couple of years. Yeah. When you're in a wedding band, a successful one, you can do that. Yeah. Um, and that was great. But I did realise, uh, I was sensible enough to realise that the writing's on the wall. When you get into your 30s, you know, you, you've got to start thinking about the future. Mm-hmm. And um, as you get progressively fatter and bolder, you have to think, am I going to get away with doing pop tunes for the next 20 years? Yeah. So as music's the only thing I could do. I had no skills anywhere else. I had no further education, so I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to grow with my family? How am I going to create a business for my family? I'd been giving away gigs up until that point to friends because people would phone me, can you do my wedding? Couldn't do, do it. it. Couldn't do it. So you would give it away. You'd phone up a pal, you and Halkett from DeVille, who's still in our books, um, would get some of the gigs and maybe whoever was available. Yeah. And then I thought, hang on, there's a business here. I'm doing light what? bulb moment. Light bulb moment. And uh, we started to hire a band, mm-hmm. and we were the smallest agency in the world with zero clients. And an agency's clients to to explain aren't the people who book the bands; they're the bands themselves. Yeah. You need a band to trust you, to represent them, mm-hmm. and to give you give the, you their diary. Um, so it was impossible, well, next to impossible. I, I just ashamed friends into letting me represent them and yep. try and get them a few gigs. Yep. And uh, of course, back then we weren't we weren't registered for VAT or anything, so we were fairly inexpensive. And I think I was charging five or ten percent commission. Right. Um, you know, so we were cheap to use for for bands as well. And we had some great bands, but we had also some diabolical bands. And I had to take everybody, um, and to try and get them a gig. But you know. Again, we were lucky in that the timing was right for that. At that time, agents were still in the in the seventies. There was still that um, the agent was the guy that you went to. You phoned the agent to get a, to get a band for your for your club, uh, or for your pub, or your or your you know your your holiday park or something like that. But more and more people were coming to the internet, and we thought, why not build a website that showcases the, the bands that we can represent and we were cutting edge you know we, we built this website if, if you go back there's a there's a google process you can look at old versions of websites and if you do that with a higher band setting it if it takes you back far enough it was hilarious but it worked you know it really yeah. worked yeah and uh, we were always trying to lead the way we got ourselves the first well, one of the first websites in the in, in the uk to have uh, streaming music we, we could load up music onto the server oh it was a nightmare Doing it, and I built the website myself mm-hmm. with a hooky version of um, what was it called? Something to do with Page. I forget what it was called. That software, and we built the, the website with that. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, very quickly, realised I was out of my depth, and we got people to help us. A guy yeah. called Billy Murphy. Actually, we were talking about Pulse earlier. Oh, Billy yeah. was the original, yep. uh, one of the original guys in Pulse, and he built our one of our first websites, and yeah. it just expanded and grew. And um, as for as today now, it's a it's a it's a huge site Incredible. with about five hundred bands on it. Is but that many? Aye, <laughs> we we'll cover the whole of the UK. You yeah. see. Yeah. Well, that's that because it's not just higher band Scotland anymore. No. Um, it's it's you've 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 stretched right down to as we far down a, as we have an office in in London. London. Yep. We used to have eleven offices across the UK because we were the first entertainment agency in the world, as far as I know, to franchise. Mm-hmm. The idea was great. We thought we could replicate this everywhere. And um, the trouble with us operating from one office and covering the whole of the UK was I'm, I pride myself on having seen every band we represent and I've heard them. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were bringing on English bands that we couldn't possibly go and see mm-hmm. or hear. And we were so we were in that horrible position where you're booking a band you've never heard for a client you've never met in a venue you've never been to. And so we thought, listen, we've done well in Scotland. And we'd become the, dom- the dominant agency for the wedding industry in Scotland. And I thought, let's recreate that. And let's find guys who are into music um, who want to start a business and work for themselves. So we, we set up the, the Hire a Band Network, which was our franchise network. And uh, <clears throat> it was incredibly successful. It, it was a really, really hard work. That was in 2011, I believe, 2010, 2011. 
Uh, so we set that up, and we very very quickly um, got our franchisees on board. So we had all these various offices from Newcastle down to down to uh, Devon, I think, with a, a, an office in Exeter. Really, as far back as oh, then? Aye, as far back as that. That, right? that took about two years to get the, the, the network to the size it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but various things happened. Some franchisees um, were more successful than others. But a very long story short, we ended up with our second ever guy, a guy called Irving Walker, um, who was our second ever franchisee. Eventually was taken over all the other territories. He was very successful down there. And... Um, had a, had a massive success with Hire a Band right. in England with his franchise. So COVID came along. Um, we all know about, know about that. And at that time, I had to reevaluate things. This is a, a really potted history. And I thought, when we get back, um, do I have the energy to continue trying to grow the business in England the way we'd done in Scotland, to, to dominate in England as we, as we do in Scotland? Mm-hmm. And the answer was no. I thought, I, I, we kind of got the stuff and knocked out of us a little bit during COVID yep. because we'd built the business up. It was two years of, of um, no work, basically. Mm-hmm. All we did for two years was move bookings, sometimes in five or six occasions. So you, you had a client who had the band booked for 2019 or 20, 2020 or 2021, yep. and we were continually told, right, no, it's not no, happening. Not happening. And they kept moving the goalposts. They moved it back and back and back. <clears throat> um, so we had some clients, poor souls, who had their wedding bands or their wedding dates moved four or five, sometimes six times. Wow. And that's all we did for two years um, was deal with, with that, with no income, you know. Um, but the, the business was robust. We, we had built a, a good business. And that also, I think, brought home to some of the franchisees that it was tough, mm-hmm. you know. But Irving, having uh, done so well in the London office, was... Um, in a great position. He's also a good bit younger than I am, so he's still got that hunger. Um, he's only in his, uh, his late 30s now, he's Irving. Um, but anyway, he had the, the drive and the ambition to, to grow the English business. So what we did was, we, we all the offices became under came under Irving's control and we licensed Hire a Band to Irving in England. So we're the same company, we're the same brand, but Irving's side of things he takes care of the whole of England now and he's all over the place um, right. looking at new bands and visiting clients and, and stuff and I focus my office now just on the Scottish business right and um, kind of back to where we started and that means that there's five of us in the higher band office and all we do every day day and daily is find gigs for our bands in Scotland um, sometimes we'll bring in English bands up Quite a lot of our bands will go down and do gigs for Irving, yep. um, south of the border. The rest of the world we look after in the Scottish office. So right. we we send bands all over the world. Um, Ceylon, Sri Lanka. I was going to say Ceylon. Sri Lanka is the furthest afield. Right. Yeah, but we've had v- bands in Spain, Portugal, all over Europe, the USA. There's where were we when this was happening? Well, what can I say? <laughs> we sent you to Cumnock. <laughs> we went to Cumnock. I <laughs> deepest darkest air show. I'll teach you. Oh, we. Uh, Oh, everybody who knows me probably knows that um, I was in a wedding band and uh, a wee shout out for the One Night Stand Boys. We uh, we had a really successful run. You did? Um, and and largely because of you guys. Oh, well, that's kind of you to say so. Yeah. yeah the, the product itself, the band, was really good. And you were you had really, I guess this is Limelight has, has its basis in some of the stuff you were doing for One Night Stand yeah. at the time. Because you were you were filming the band going to gigs and setting up for gigs. Yeah, we were vlogging. Oh, totally. We, we were one of the first bands probably, I would say, that put a real effort into making a vlog. Aye, because nobody knows what's involved in a, nah. a wedding, being in a wedding band. Nah. It looks and easy. And we were telling a story, you Aye. know, of Aye. Um, and a, quite a unique perspective of what it was like to, to be a wedding band and to go to all these different locations all over the country and... I tell the story of here, here, here's what it's actually like Aye. but but it was largely for us I must admit it was largely a social thing mm-hmm. you know we, we we were young guys you know young families so a large part of being in a wedding band was us getting together playing music that we loved totally and uh, getting and out the house away for the wains that's it getting out for a, a few hours <laughs> and, uh, and I loved it I absolutely loved it Aye. we one night stand and we had a as I say we had a really good a good run at it a good success with it as well and we, we decided to call it a day at, um, right before when COVID struck. Yeah, timing was good, yeah. Um, timing was we obviously good. never knew that was happening, no. but we, we called it a day just because we'd had a 10-year run at it. Mm-hmm. 
as I say, with young families and so it seemed to be the right time. But I must admit, I, I miss it. I, I miss we were just having that chat earlier. <laughs> I'm trying to talk you back in. Well, fitness. that's it. I've, I've, uh, I did a couple of Deppin gigs recently with, with Pulse and, uh, and I loved it. Last one they did was up in the, the Double Tree Hilton and uh, it was a St Paddy's night. Right. And uh, But the place was jumping. Aye. It was great. It's and amazing like, that uh, when, you're, when you're doing it and, and it's working. Yep. Um, there's nothing like it. Yeah. It's a terrific Rinse sensation. and repeat and just, but, but that kind of brings me on to my first question. Because um, you can, to, to an extent, rinse and repeat. You know, mm-hmm. you can, you've got a set list and you, you, you know, whatever you need to do. But, you know, the wed- wedding industry and, and music is ever evolving. So you've been in the game 25 years. Mm-hmm. How do you stay relevant then in terms of, you know, as in an evolving industry, how do you stay relevant for, for what you're doing to get continuous business coming through? There's a couple of things. You keep your ears open. Um, you have to try and model yourself on the most successful bands that are doing their thing. There's no there's no shame in that. I mean, every every band has learned from other bands. So you've got to look and see who who's been successful, who who are who are the bands that are popular? Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Um you have to make sure that you're listening to music. You have to keep rehearsing. And you have to, I think, I'm going to, it sounds um, set up, but you, if you've got an agency that's working with a lot of different bands, an agent is a good source of, of um, information about what's current, what should work. Mm-hmm. So it, it's incre- it amazes me every time. Um, songs you think are going to really do well that flop, and tunes that we've been playing since, you know, Christ left Kilburnie, um, <laughs> still work. You know, those classics still work. Yep. You've got to listen. You've got to talk to other musicians. Um, and you've got to be prepared to learn. Um, the worst thing you can do if you're in a band is think, we all think we're great. We would never do it. You need ego to go on a stage and, and stand up in front of people and, and show off. Um, the danger is when you believe your own hype. Um, if you think and you're convinced you're the best, and you don't need to learn, that's a massive mistake. Mm-hmm. Because you'll just keep doing the same old stuff. When my band started, we were we were in a patch on some of the big names that were that were going around. And I won't mention any of the names, but um, if you're an Ayrshire, you'll know who I mean. But all those bands didn't move on. They wanted to keep playing the stuff they were playing. And as I said earlier, MIDI, MIDI files came along, and backing tracks came along, and music changed. Mm-hmm. And if you're resting on your laurels, you'll be left behind. It's the same as an agent, you know, you have to keep changing and looking for the new things that benefit your bands, the bands you represent or the yep. entertainers you represent. So you stay relevant by asking questions, you go to live music events, you, you watch bands with an open mind. If when you go, if you're in a band and you go to a wedding and you're watching the band there, a lot of guys and girls will sit and think, that's, 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 that's garbage, that's not the right chord or that's the wrong words or what I wrote in key or the tempos, that's, that's irrelevant. Um, you've really got to sit there and say, okay, what can I learn? What, what's working in the dance floor? When I'm a, as an agent, when I go and see a band, I do, I, I'll spend a wee bit of time looking at the band to make sure they know what they're doing, um, that the chemistry's right on the stage. But the rest of the time, I watch the crowd and the reaction in the crowd. And whether I like a band or not, um, you know, musically taste, if, from the, the, the point of view of musical taste, that's not relevant either. Uh, you have to watch the effect that a band has. Interacting. Exactly. Yeah. So... There, I remember, they'll not mind me saying this, we look after the McDonald brothers who had massive X Factor fame mm-hmm. and um, they, they, they they took some pelters because they'd, they'd been an X Factor for a start, you know, and that was considered, you know, imagine going an X Factor and you, all this kind of stuff. Those boys, to this day, are massively successful. They're out for us this weekend mm-hmm. um, and they learn, they, they do cruise ships, really high-end stuff, you know, um, and they learned that it didn't matter what people thought of them or said about them, mm-hmm. they, they were laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah. And um, they are incredibly popular, mm-hmm. but they are always changing what they do. They're just two guys, yeah. you know. Um, they listened and they learned. Mm-hmm. And um, they were humble enough to accept that they'd have to learn things that, you know, the other bands were doing that were a success. So if you think you're the bee's knees, and you know you're you're busy now, doesn't mean to say you've got a you've got a clear run at it for the rest of the time. Yeah. You have to keep current, mm-hmm. and you have to remember one big important thing. And this is the thing I say to all bands: brides and grooms, or brides and brides and grooms and grooms, couples, 
that they stay the same age. They never get any older. Right. But we all get older. We do. <laughs> Your average uh, couple in Scotland now getting married is 27 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that sadly can't be said for the musicians and bands. We all get older. Yeah. So you have. there's a point. You have to remember who your audience is. Mm -hmm. um, now, what you're finding now is that the guys, well, younger than me, because I'd be the grandparents' age now, but the, <laughs> the younger, the, the bands are um, similar age to the mums and dads who have a big say on which band gets booked for a wedding. Yeah, that's right. So you've got to appeal to a wide range of people. There's no point in being, you know, really niche and really yeah. focused. Um, you have to have a wide range of appeal. And you do that by taking care of the mums and dads and the, the couples that, that happens to be getting married. Um, and that's, you've got to understand when it's time to, to change, but also when it's time to hang up the microphone yeah. um, uh, or maybe take a back seat or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that comes to us all. Uh, and it's interesting you say that because, um, so in my own experience with the band, we were playing songs that I would never imagined we would play. Yeah. You know, but you, you just found there were floor fillers. Every time. You know, and you were like, and you could almost guarantee this is going oh, to get aye. people on the dance floor. Well, we, you know, you're playing a bit of uh, Superstition, Stevie Wonder, aye. you know, yep. or uh, whatever. And you can guarantee folk are going to go on the dance floor oh, for aye. that. You think, is that a song that I would normally play? No, probably not. So it's a bit, a bit of putting your ego aside as well, isn't it? Totally. In terms of totally. What, what do the crowd need here? And aye. Get well, up. there's no point in playing the latest chart tune. Yep. Um, because A, not everybody will be familiar enough with it um, and B it might it won't survive the test of time yeah. the you, you, there are modern classics obviously mm -hmm. but there are tunes we used to refer to them as break glass in case of emergency <laughs> and you're, you're struggling with a floor you can't get the floor full it had to be Mustang Sally hit yeah. it with respect little respect and, and it's going to work yeah. they're dreadful you know songs to, to play respect's a hard song to sing people don't understand how difficult it is to sing Aye. Um Andy Bell, who sang it, had a great range. And um, it's very hard, very hard to get across, if you, especially if you've got a big rocky voice, very hard to control. Um, and I've heard it murdered a million times. But even if you murder it, it'll still save your day on the dance floor. Absolutely. Um, so there's these tunes you have to pull out. But you still, when you said about having that interaction as well, that we used to do, um, when we did Superstition Stevie Wonder, and you would get through it, and that would be fine. But we, we always threw in a, like a dance-off, you know, Aye. and it was the best part of our night. You know, you would just break it down, drummers just still keeping away, and then we would get guys versus girls sort of thing on the dance floor, and what a laugh. Just, that, that just, and that was, that was the talking point of the totally, night. Totally, totally. It wasn't know, about how good like, we were or how, how well we played. Or Most bands are playing the same tunes, Stuart. That's yeah. the thing, right? So most bands, if they're, if they're taking my advice and they're listening to other bands, they're playing the same tunes. We're yep. all doing it. There's, and there's a reason for that, because they work. So there's no point in doing really niche stuff, you know, um, because it won't work. Mm -hmm. So we play the same tunes. Most musicians now are incredibly talented and competent. When I started... In those days, back in the 90s, early 90s and the late 80s, if if our drummer wasn't available, we that gig was off mm -hmm. because we didn't know how to play with a depth drummer. and mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't have the, the confidence or the ability. Yep. Nowadays, depths are very, very common. Yep. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, there's a line got to be drawn where depths are concerned right enough, and we'll come to that. We were talking about that earlier with the, the collective bands. But depths are now, you, you can now get such talent um, in Scotland that it's just it's mind blowing, mm -hmm. um, and you can get uh, guys now who are just off the scale great. Yeah, there's there's very few. There are a few really poor bands out there, but they don't last long because nobody books them. Yeah, right. um, so the best bands are always busy, and the quality is really high. So what, how do you? What's the differentiator? What's different between band A and band B? Why, if the two bands are playing the same songs, is one much busier than the other? Yeah, and it's a lot to do with chemistry on stage. Mm -hmm and how a band behaves off stage. Yep. So from with the chemistry thing, what I often say to bands is, if I feel I'd like to be in your band, that's what that's how I'd decide whether a band, whether we can help with a band or not. If it looks like such fun that I'd like to get the break the old microphone out the glass box and and you know join in. Uh, if I if I think that and the couples or the corporate client or whoever's having the event thinks the same, oh, that looks like fun, mm -hmm. you'll attract bookings. Yep. If you take yourself too seriously and you're a bit of a shoegazer or we used to call them that, or if you're, um, if, you're a, if you're a 
twiddler, you can do all the you can do all the steely dan numbers and yep. the, the written key and all the rest of it. You can do all of that. Mm-hmm. You take it really, really seriously. It's dull. Yeah, it's just dull. Right. Yeah. So there's it's a lot, and it's not just about the music. In fact, the music's only I'd say seventy percent of what's required to make a really good band. Yeah. You know, it's 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 the knowing what to play and when to play it. Again, most of us know that. If you've been doing it any length of time, you'll learn. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, there's a lot more involved. For instance, it's uh, about turning up on time, um, maybe even early. Um, positive feedback, social proof is massive. We've got a band, well, most of our bands have got an awful lot of uh, very, very positive feedback. We've got a band, The True Loves, with over 500 five-star reviews. It's, un- right. it's unbelievable. Wow. Um, and if you leave the the, the gig uh, and you've left everybody in a high, you will get more gigs from that gig. That's how you that's how your diary helps. But of course, you have to um, get the momentum in the first place, and that's where agents come in. Mm-hmm. But I'm probably going off piste again a wee bit there. I'm going to do that. But uh, getting back to what makes the band relevant, yeah, and successful. It's about how you interact yep. with with your audience. If you just play at them. You'll be fine. You'll get paid, but you won't be memorable. You'll be memorable. No, absolutely. I think, and again, and again, in my experience, a lot of our, our success came from you know a memorable performance and interaction. It wasn't necessarily about. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm a brilliant musician. I'm, I'm probably your best average person you'll ever meet. <laughs> um, so, and that's that's, but that's enough because I'd probably say we had enough charisma as a band Aye. to interact with people completely and, and and have them enjoy their night. Aye. You know, our charisma's huge. What um, in terms of I mean you've you've been in this game a long time so you know what is there anything that you would say has been quite pivotal in terms of the success of of Hire a Band and how you know just anything that's contributed to yeah we're on the right track here and it's 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 helping us to be successful. Oh aye, there's a there's a you could there's a number of landmarks um, from when Hire a Band started. The first thing I think was our first member of staff um, who we poached from a hotel. Um, a woman called Elizabeth Stewart who was and is incredibly organised mm-hmm. so I was running the business myself with a little computer um, from home uh, and I, if you know me, and you do I'm not particularly well organised and I chase the shiniest new thing that comes along, so if right. an interesting project comes in I'm away and I'm full in, into that yep. and I needed somebody to organise my time and organise the paperwork, because mm-hmm. being an agent is all about organisation, it's essential you can't have double bookings if you're an agent. So Elizabeth came along and made me or made the business uh, respectable in that we would get back to people in time. Our paperwork was tidy, it was accurate, all of that. Not long after Elizabeth joined the business, and this is maybe 2000, I think, 2001, so not long after that. And it was a big step that was terrifying because I suddenly was responsible for somebody's salary, salary. somebody's income. Aye, absolutely. Know. And they came from a job, a real job. Mm-hmm come about from a wee tin pot agency <laughs> so uh, that was a big that was a big step then we got our own in fact we had premises at that time I took on down in the APL centre in Stevenson I took on a glorified cupboard I think it was 50 quid a month um, and you just rolled up you paid them their 50 quid and you got a you didn't get a phone or anything like that but you get heat and you got <laughs> you got to use the lose it was totally wee uh, office um, and that got us to continue to grow 2004, my wife Lisa um, was at that time uh, a full-time senior social worker. One one thing every musician needs is a, a, a breadwinner and a social worker. Yeah. I had that combined with Lisa. Um, but she was having our second daughter, Sophie. And once the, the baby was born, she was on maternity leave. And I'd been... Lisa, if you know, and you do know Lisa, is the brains of the operation. So anything, any good ideas, I'll be honest, came from Lisa. Sure. And she was still working full time for North Ayrshire Council. Right. But we decided we would take this massive risk and that she wouldn't go back to the council uh, job. She would come and work at Hire Band. Mm-hmm. That was in 2004, I believe. And that, we just skyrocketed after that. Right. We combined um, Elizabeth's uh, ability as an organiser and Lisa's entrepreneurial flair and uh, her Lisa's and your, your good looks my good looks I'm merely the attractive figurehead <laughs> of the business as, uh, as I tell everybody um, and it meant that I could make more tea but <laughs> ultimately uh, 
she brought this. I, I, I have I, I'm the ideas guy. I have, I have the ideas. Ninety five percent of them are garbage. Don't work. But there's some gems in there. The, the franchise and things. Starting the business in the first place. Those wee things. But the the day to day um, savvy that Hire a Band has now and had then came from Lisa and from Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And so after that things went meteoric and we just we, we were getting bands more gigs better gigs we were easing prices up because bands were performing at weddings for the same money back in, in 19, uh, 1999 to 2000 2002 for what they were getting in the 70s and 80s right. it was a very very poor yeah. so we thought wait a minute you're, you're knocking your pan out here for four hours that's just while you're at the event there's the time leading up to the event there's the time afterwards you have the, travel the, and get there the travel and all the kit you have to buy Aye. all the rehearsal time these are all things that you don't see and um, when you're when you're hiring a band, mm-hmm. anyway, our staff quickly grew. We, in our office, we kept moving within the APL centre to bigger and bigger offices. And I think at our peak, we had eight members of staff. Mm-hmm. And uh, back in those days, the one person's only job was to record DVDs or CDs of band demos, put them in a padded envelope, and post them out. We were, Is that our, right? our postage bill was horrendous. <laughs> That's how we sent demos to people because you, you couldn't at that time put them on web because not the web. Wasn't what it was. Nothing. And the internet didn't have the bandwidth to play True. tunes and stuff. It was fine if you wanted to wait for a week for a tune to download. <laughs> so we, 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 we had a bunch of uh, one person whose only job was to do this: make okay. and sit and distribute um, these uh, these demos. Um, and then the business just kept growing and growing and growing. Yeah. We moved the office. In fact, we bought a building in West Kilbride. Uh, I can't quite remember when that was, but it was in the I in the noughties at some point. But in, I think it was actually I. And we bought that building and we filled that and we had some tenants and stuff and that was all great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, we were in there until during COVID and then when COVID was over, we were made an offer we couldn't refuse and we sold the building and now we're back renting at a small office, but it's a shop front, still in Mesco Bride. Yep. Uh, the team's now down to five and um, some people left and, and whatnot. So we're down to five. It's a kind of hybrid office now. Mm-hmm. So during COVID, we, we could work from home um, or in the office Obviously, the rules were that we couldn't all be in the office at the same sure. time. So we, we invested quite heavily, in fact, in really good tech that lets us now operate from anywhere in the world, really. So sometimes we're all in the office at the same time, um, and sometimes we can work from home. It depends, really, on what's involved. Um, and that's where we are right now, 2024. So, so with, that, with that being said, um, you know, operating out of a shop front, a big online presence that you've got... Um, Tell me about your competitors. How, what makes Hire a Band the go-to wedding function oh, corporates? They'll, they'll probably be watching this and they'll love this. <laughs> Actually, we got on really well with our competitors. There are there are a number of agencies in Scotland, not as many as there used to be. Yep. So it's a difficult the the, the um, access to running a, a decent sized agency now is uh, it's quite difficult to to get in and to do it because there's so much the competition's so good. Yep, um, and. Our main competitors, two of the guys, there's a company called Coast Entertainment run by uh, Palman Andy Donnelly and there's Elite Bands run by James Duffin. Mm-hmm. Both of those guys were in bands on our roster. Right. So they kind of learned how, how it was done from the inside and then, you know, you can't you can't um, copyright a good idea. There have been agents before me um, and the guys come along and built their businesses to successful businesses, you know. Yep. Um, what makes us, I think, the best is the team. Um, we have... Years and years of experience within the within the office. Uh, our office manager, um, a lady called Gay Young, who I also and it's a good story, but uh, how we got to working with Gay, and if if I've got time, I'll tell you. But Gay is a machine, and yeah. um, as you know, and I've said this before. If I had ten Gay Youngs, I could rule the world. Is that right? No problem, no problem at all. She's great. She's immense. You yeah. know, she runs the office. Um, the, the quick story with Gay: when I was still gigging, we asked if we could go and play at the Scottish Wedding Show way back in, oh God knows, before 90, was it 19, about 1998, 1999. And they said, well, okay, nobody's ever asked if they could play before, so they they let us do it. And we performed before and after each catwalk show in the SEC. So it was my it was on my CV very early that I'd performed <laughs> in the SECC. I had to pay to be there right enough. <laughs> and uh, Lisa came along and she was still working, you know, in fact, she came along pregnant. She said she'd been pregnant with probably Rachel at right. that time. And we went on and did our thing. And it was like shooting fish in a barrel. It was brilliant. Yeah. And I think that weekend, our first weekend doing that, we picked up 50, 50 firm bookings. Right. Um, and we did that show for a few years until they, they wised up and stopped us 
stop letting us go because it's a long story. But anyway, on that first day, um, there's all these other exhibitors opposite us, and mm -hmm. we we also learned when you're doing a when you're in a wedding band, you're 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 working alongside other wedding suppliers, not just you know the other musicians in the band. Mm -hmm. So you've got the venue, you've got the you've got the, the florists, you've got all the different people that are there. Yep. Guys bringing in the kind of photographer and videographers, we're really the guys yep. that, that meet them most. Mm -hmm. And we realised one of the, one of the reasons that my band was so successful back then was we were just amenable. We just didn't cause anybody any bother. If somebody said jump, we would say how high. If the yeah. venue said turn it down, we turned it down. If they put you in a daft wee corner, we just go on with it. Um, so all of that meant that we were taking into consideration all the other exhibitors at the Scottish Wedding Show because you're playing fairly loud. We had a big old PVPA at the time, we were blasting out Robbie Williams tunes and stuff. <laughs> um, but Gay was working. In this on the stand for Stackus at that time, there was a, vein, a hotel in, in Bells Hill, Stackus Strathclyde, now the Hilton Strathclyde, I think. And uh, she was in charge of the events there. So she booked my band to do her, their Christmas party nights. Right. And that also gave us a wee chance to start putting other bands into that. But that was our first corporate client. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we went on and grew, grew higher, a band and we went on through the ranks with, with Stackus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, about 10 years ago, we both lived in West Bride. And uh, I know her husband, John, really well. And um, she was looking for a job, looking for something new. No brainer. And she came along and, and helped us save the business because at that time, in fact, that was in 2008, at that time, the the credit crunch had, had come along. Right, of course. And, and wedding bookings just plummeted. Yeah. People were switching to the DJs, DJs and right. that kind of thing. Venues were doing their party nights, were no longer banned and DJ. It was just, just a DJ. Right. We're charging the same money, though. If you wanted to go along for your party night, you weren't getting a, a, any money knocked off. They were just not paying for bands, and it was really poor. And it took until ten, to 2010, I'd say, for that to kind of get behind us and, you know, for, for things to come back. Mm -hmm. But Gay was in just working whatever hours we could afford to pay her at that time because things were really tough. Yep. Um, and uh, she's been with us ever since. And as a machine, and we've got Karen Cunningham now. We've had great staff. I've never... I've been incredibly successful with the people that we've worked with yep. um, everybody we're still in great terms with everybody that's come and been a part of Hire a Band yep. uh, it's all been women is it aye uh, best man for a job is a woman <laughs> I'll probably get a hate crime uh, charge now <laughs> for saying that but it's a fact um, and they are just I, I, I refer to all my team they're like um, it's like an Apple computer and a, a PC the, the girls work the, like an Apple computer they work at the yep. same rate they're, they're, they're working as hard at five as they were at nine mm -hmm. I'm like a PC I do a job and I'm like oh I could, I'll take a wee break and pat myself <laughs> in the back you know uh, yep. but the, the team are just immense and they treat hire a band like their business God help you if you if you have a go at hire a band in front of any of my guys yep. because they won't tolerate it they, oh, and they're, they're family and you know, they're friends and yeah. it's just great so I've been blessed Good for uh, you. With, with great staff yeah. all my life brilliant yeah, well, last question. Um, I've really enjoyed getting a wee bit of insight to, fun. to to hire a band. As I say, my personal dealings with, with hire a band were brilliant. Um, so just to kind of finish up, as as this is a, a podcast about you know business and entrepreneurship and how to how to really keep a business successful, um, what would you say for you are the kind of key leadership principles that you prioritise in running your 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 business and in terms of like cultivating a, a a positive and productive environment, what would you say are those key principles that, that kind of drive you and keep things going? There's one um, main one. If you're running a business my size, it's micro business, a tiny wee business, um, as I say, the most num the, the highest number of staff we've had has been seven or eight. There's now five of us. You, you should always employ people that are better than you. Mm -hmm. um, when you start a business, you have to wear all the hats. Yep. You know, you're you're everything. Um, but when you are in a position where you can start to employ people, you should always find somebody who you know is either already better than you or could be better than you, whatever it is you did. Um, you you can't specialise at everything because that's just a negative. You know, it, it can't be done. You can only specialise in one thing at a time. Um, I like to have the ideas, but I'm rotten at implementing them and seeing them through. Um, I get bored quite quickly. Right. Um, so you need to find people who are superior to you at whatever it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the, the most important thing. Um, that's the touchstone, really. 
you have to let your as a as a leader of the business as the as the founder of the business you have to let your ego go as well mm-hmm. um, you have to understand when when um, somebody's better at something than you are and you you mustn't micromanage you must give people the, them to go on that. let them do it yeah. they'll build it um my my, uh, my daughter Rachel works for the business now she's 26 she's the only person in our family with a with a degree uh, in business and therefore the only person who knows what they're doing in, in higher band when it comes to the, to the management side of things um, and she's now I mean I'm, she's 26 I'm four, 58 and uh, nearly shaved 10 years off there <laughs> so she's current with with stuff you know when Instagram came along and stuff like that I haven't really bad at all of that kind of stuff at uh, TikTok and whatever mm-hmm. um, Rachel that's that's her that's her language that's what she speaks um, and she's very ambitious for the business mm-hmm. so she's way better than me at Pretty much everything now. Um, they, they, they wheel me out when bands are uh, when we're thinking about which bands to, to take on because I'm the I'm the resident musician or um, ex musician. <laughs> uh, so I still have to have the say when it comes to which bands yep. we, we work with. Yep. Um, but the rest of the the day to day stuff and we just revamped our, our Mailchimp for instance, which is all our follow up emails. Mm-hmm. I had done that ten years ago. It hadn't changed in, in ten years. Mm-hmm. Rachel was horrified when she saw the, the job I was doing. So that's all been changed recently. All the new uh, initiatives that we've had have not come from me. Um, they've all come from other members of staff. One of the best things we ever did came from a fantastic, which still worked for us, uh, a girl called Nicola Bell, now Nicola Fitzpatrick. If you're watching this, Nicola, thanks very much. She had a brilliant idea uh, years ago. Uh, when she was getting married, she'd noticed that many companies were, were charging a wee support fee, a wee bit additional fee. Um, and we thought, she said, why don't we do that? And I thought, well, can we justify it? Well, we can, because we take credit card payments, debit card payments, we issue contracts. There's a, there's a lot of expense involved just in the admin side of things that we do. So we started um, adding that. That's the only charge we make to a client. When you hire a band from hire a band, you're paying the band fee. The band pays us. Mm-hmm. But the we, we charge a £25 plus VAT support fee that was not my idea that was Nicola Bell's idea uh, and it's financed a lot of uh, the marketing for hire a band and it's enabled us to get better and better we use electronic contracts now which we, we didn't oh, yeah. used to do um, so we've got the very best um, software now we've got a package our business is running a, on a platform called Overture which is custom built for our agency um, and all of that it's a very expensive piece of software but that's the costs of that are met by those little support fee things, you know. Um, so that was a great idea. Yeah. It wasn't mine. Um, the franchise thing was probably one of mine. Um, but getting it to where it was, that was a Lisa thing, yeah. you know. Um, and as I say, the, the the changes to the website, the changes to the way we deal with clients, that's Gay Young. Mm-hmm. Um, so none of these ideas were mine. And, I'm, and I think that's made me a brilliant manager yeah. and a brilliant leader because I, uh, I don't have to do that kind yeah. of stuff. That's what that they do that. And that lets me come and do things like this. Or, <laughs> you know, or, or, or take the time. You have to take time to think, where are we going next? Yeah. How are we going to handle this crisis that's coming along? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing been bigger than COVID. Right. Um, and, you know, I dealt with that. I dealt with the kind of negative side of that, the screamers and the people that were angry that, you know, the situation had, had presented itself. And that, that took a toll, you know, it really did. Mm-hmm. But that team of mine were still there to do all the, 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 the day and daily stuff that I don't have the temperament to do, the, the, the repetitive stuff yeah. with the accuracy that they've got. So your team must be better than you or must have the potential to be better than you. And if you hire somebody that you think, I'll keep them in their place, then you made a massive mistake. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a wasted opportunity. That's good, solid advice. I think that's the that's yeah. that's how we've run the business. There's yeah. nothing else. I've not you know. Well, for being in the business twenty five years and, and still going strong, I would say that's, that's really good. We're doing advice. something right, you know. <laughs> and, the, and the core, the, the the foundations of the business are, are really solid. We were yeah. able to get through COVID without yeah. too much damage, and um, you know we're still hungry for new bands. Mm-hmm. Rachel's plan is for the next 25 years, we've got a thing called Project 25, which is her plans for the next 25 years of Hire a Band. Um, and uh, it's incredible to see what the, the things, the potential, the AI coming along and, yeah. and all of this. Uh, the potential's massive. Mm-hmm. And the industry is constantly changing, but it's still the same thing. People still need to go somewhere to find... Good entertainment. Exactly. Yeah. And that'll never change. No, of course you're like, right. Death and taxes, people want to be entertained. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, listen, thanks very much. I really appreciate it was a pleasure. Uh, your time coming down and giving, giving us a wee bit of insight to your business. And uh, I'll leave all of Dell's details below. If you're a band, uh, if you're a budding band, get in touch with this guy. You will not go wrong, um, especially if you're looking to get into the wedding or the function band uh, entertainment sort of industry. You, you, you'll not go wrong with, with totally. Highland. Totally, we'd love that. That'd be great. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, whatever you're listening on, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, that will help us to grow the channel and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Many Hats Podcast. Remember to hit subscribe to be notified of all new episodes. For any questions or topic ideas, you can reach Stuart on Instagram at many underscore hats underscore podcast. We'll see you next time.